Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 780 for December 4th, 2023. And I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is Jason Howell. Now, it's been a minute since Jason has joined me on the show, but you probably know him from his wonderful work over on the Twit Network, where he claims to be the guy on tech podcasts who knows everything. Welcome to the show, Jason. I do not. I didn't even know how to say the word plank, so I definitely don't know everything. (laughs) No, I was just listening to you host uh, This Week in Tech, uh, and and one of the things Jason said was that he had to get over thinking that he had to be the guy who knew everything. So oh, yeah, for sure. I, 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 I would imagine that everybody in podcasting has probably experienced that at some point or another, right? Like once you do this long, once you do this for a while, and you realize like part of my job is talking into a microphone, and the other part of that job is that people actually listen to the words that I say <laughs> and make their own judgments and you know and, and understandings about what you're saying and everything. I, I'm pretty sure most podcasters have probably encountered a point where they kind of realize like, wait a minute, what like do I need to know everything about everything that I'm talking about? Or can I be okay with the fact that I don't know everything? At least that was my kind of journey. And it took me a long time to kind of get to the point where I could be like, you know what? It's cool. Like people aren't following me because they think I know everything. They're just following me because they like me and maybe my perspective on things, even the things I don't know. Well, I have found luckily that if you're wrong, the internet will actually tell you. Yeah, that's true. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't want the internet to tell me though, because it, it depends on how they tell you, right? Like, tell me nicely, tell me constructively. Sadly, the I'm internet the one. doesn't always do that. I am the one. They'll be up there going, as as Tom and Molly would say. Well, actually, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's that all right much. though, because at this point, the well actually is is a thing. It's a thing. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Looping it all together there. Uh-huh. Well, before we get started, uh, what are you working on these days so people have context for where to find you and the kind of things that you do? Well, I mean, podcast wise, you know, I'm, I'm working for the Twit Network, This Week in Tech. Um, so that's twit.tv. And basically there I am, I'm doing a number of things right now. COVID, the, the pandemic really kind of changed um, a lot of the roles at Twit. Um, so right now I am hosting Tech News Weekly, which is an, a tech interview show along with Micah Sargent, another host on the network. Uh, we do that every Thursday, and that's you know that's basically the the evolution or the successor to Tech News Today, which Tom Merritt, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, um, he was brought to the network and started that show, and it's it's kind of over the years, kind of evolved and transformed, and you know in the last several years, it's been uh, more of like an interview slash discussion show uh, called Tech News Weekly, and then um, I'm also doing an AI show, which is specifically for the club called AI Inside, along with Jeff Jarvis, who is one of the co-hosts on This Week in Google on the network, but um, just talking about, you know, this crazy thing called AI, because if you hadn't noticed, I swear, like every show that we do, at least on Twit, half the stories are AI involved in some way, shape, or form. I was like, wow, AI is really inside everything. I was like, oh, well, there you go. There's the name, AI Inside. Kind of like so Intel inside. <laughs> I want to draw attention to what Jason just said. He referred to the club and um, the one of the monetary or monetization things that they've done over at Twit is is Club Twit. And I'm a member of Club yeah. Twit. And oh, thank you. don't tell Lee or Lisa, but it is priced far too low. Oh, I think yeah. it's seven this. bucks a month and you get all of the shows ad free. Every single yeah. show on Twit ad free for seven dollars. A lot of the shows are like nine bucks a month for one show. And so, yeah, like shows outside of Twit. It's crazy yeah, low. I, I, and I know that they know that uh, because it's come up a lot. Um, but, you know, they really want to put it at a price point that more people will be inclined to, to buy into. I mean, and, you know, you, you mentioned like the shows themselves that people you know would normally get without any ads. Like that's kind of the cool thing about that particular club as well. Club Twit has like all these shows that don't exist outside of the club. AI inside being one. So I you're right. Know that. Oh, you didn't know that. Today yeah, I some learned. Of the, some of the shows inside of the club you can't get outside of the club. Or they might release an epi- you know, like one episode a month just to give you a taster or whatever. So, yeah, it is interesting how everybody kind of chooses to monetize their platforms and everything. And I, I, I know that I've heard Lisa and Leo talk about you know people mentioning that, hey, I'd pay much more. They really want to set the price low. And then if someone wants to give more, they have the, the freedom to do so. Yeah, I don't want to discourage this behavior. I'm just trying to sell it as as I think it yeah. is the best deal. Because, and yeah. even if you don't listen to it's every show, deal. if you listen to one show, that's still cheaper than one show of another network. So totally, uh, I, I really like it. Now you're also yeah. a producer too, right? 
Yeah, so that was that was kind of the the uh, second part of what I was mentioning as far as um as far as the pandemic kind of coming you know happening uh, to all of us and really kind of changing things. Prior to that, I was full time hosting, and then once that happened, you know there were some changes made, and uh, I ended up uh, kind of moving back into a lead producer role for many of Leo's uh, biggest shows, in, including This Week in Tech. So, so you know I'm I'm in front of the camera on my own shows and producing those. I'm also behind the camera and producing some of Leo's biggest shows. And then when Leo's out, you know, like this last weekend, um, like, you sat uh, in the like big you chair. yeah, I sat in the big chair and got to lead an episode, you know, lead host an episode of this week in tech. It was a heck of a lot of fun. Very fun. And, uh, yeah. while music isn't, isn't my thing, uh, you're also a musician, right? <laughs> yeah, I've been making music since I was a kid. So I, you know, I, I'm always trying to, continue the, uh, the the kind of emphasis in my life on music, but it really ebbs and flows. It comes in and out because life is life is busy and making time for music is something that I value deeply, um, but it can be really hard in the midst of all the other things that I kind of have to do to, you know, pay the bills. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Well, the There's reason that. I wanted to get uh, you on the show was I was listening to an episode of the Clockwise podcast and you mentioned that you are an Android user who uses a mm. Mac. And I thought yeah. it might be really interesting to talk about what that experience is, especially since a few years ago, I had Chris Ashley of the SMR podcast on to talk about how he uses an iPhone with a Windows machine. And I live in this very, very tight little Apple bubble where I basically never step my toe outside of the bubble. And so I can't even picture how it works I don't even understand how you do anything with those two completely different platforms. So I thought it might be really fun to walk through how you how how does that even work? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's a really great um question. Uh, and apparently it is because you're not the only one to ask me. Like literally just yesterday when I was on Twit and I was monitoring the Discord, um I think we had an Android story. Like the the panel on Twit yesterday was like half Android half iOS, half iPhone. And there was somebody in the Discord that, you know, made notice of the fact that I was using a MacBook and, uh, or I may have made it some sort of comment about using a Mac. And this person was like, so like, like could not understand, like how on, why on earth are you using a Mac if you've got an Android device? Why aren't you using a PC? And, uh, you know, that comes up time and time again. It's like, well, yeah, I, I mean, a PC isn't running Android. Like, I, you know, Actually, Android is, it's, <laughs> is its own operating system, a mobile operating system. It just so happens that Apple has its own mobile operating system that integrates with what, really well with its desktop operating system. So I don't know. Like, yeah, I guess it doesn't way it seem makes, weird to me, but I understand why it does to others. Yeah, I guess it makes more, uh, it's more weird that Chris Ashley uses an iPhone on Windows. Because <laughs> right, he could right. be in one ecosystem, but you, by definition, whatever your desktop platform is, it's not going to be from from Google. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and and I might even push back on the on the weird aspect too. I think, I think at this point, these these platforms are so developed that it really doesn't matter what you're using. I mean, sure, if you've got an iPhone and you've got a Macintosh uh, of some variety. Um, then there's going to be some sort of integration, some sort of cross uh, cross play between those that you're not going to get if you have another device. But that doesn't mean that if you have an Android and you're using a Mac, that like the experience is broken and painful, and and it, you just don't have the ability to do that particular thing, or you do, and you just have to get creative about it. You know, so it's it's just same but different. Yeah, we're going to walk through some details on that, and I think that's going to be kind of fun. Let's start a little bit uh, back farther in time, further in time. Uh, how long have you been a Mac user, and what kind of Mac are you sporting these days? Well, let me think here. So the first Mac that I used, I was in, gosh, was I in ninth grade or 10th grade? And uh, it was one of those, I should, I should have... Any true geek would have the model number memorized, but I don't. But it was one of those like single like beige units with the three and a quarter fly, uh, uh, oh. drive on the front, oh, like a Mac Plus maybe or yeah, okay. totally. It's the Mac Plus era. Okay, and uh, that and you know with a monochrome gray screen, and um, that was not my first computer. My first computer was a Commodore sixty four. Anyone who has heard me talk about you know computer stories from their childhood has heard me go on and on about the Commodore sixty four. That at my heart is like my computing bliss. Mm -hmm. um, um, but 
I wanted to create a, a fanzine on uh, on like heavy metal music and death metal music. I was really into that at the time. In sixth grade, um, and and I no, this was like ninth grade. Oh, sorry. And um, yeah, sixth grade with the Commodore sixty four, but the Commodore couldn't do these kinds of things to the degree that I wanted to do them. And so I got the Mac because I heard it was really great for desktop publishing. And that was kind of my introduction to Mac. And then I became a PC guy for a long time. And then I think I made the permanent switch probably around like 2002-ish, 2003, okay. somewhere around there. Okay. All right. And, w- and what do you use these days? You have something at home, something at work, I imagine? Yeah. I mean, I've got, I mean, right now, you know, for this call, I have a MacBook Pro, the 2021 um, M1 Pro, I believe, okay. on the inside. So. Okay. Um, right. yeah, which was a big step up from the, uh, 2008 Mac pro tower uh, you know, desktop that I have down here by my feet oh, that geez. I had been as my home computer up until that point. So Seriously? apparently, yeah, apparently I hold on to computers for a very long time before oh, I upgrade them. No, you just use that as a heater, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, it does absolutely nothing except if I have to like fire it up for an old music project or something like that, I can do that. But, um, but that isn't to say that like, that's the only computer I've been using prior to this laptop, you know, working for Twit, they've always had, you know, a pretty updated, uh, MacBook, uh, sure. in my hands to do the work that I do. Now, your origin story on Android, I want to uh, remind you of um, one of the last times I had you on here was on Chit Chat Across the Pond number 477. You and Megan Maroney came on because you were in the process of running an experiment switching. Right. So you were you used iOS for, like I think it was like a month, and she used Android. Uh, yeah. Were you ever tempted uh, to iOS because of that or because of anything else? I mean, I've, I really enjoyed, we, we actually did that two or three times, I think two or three years in a row, we, it, we kind of made it a, a habit. And then when Micah Sargent uh, came on a, into the role, I asked him if he wanted to do it. He was like, no. So we did, <laughs> we stopped doing that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think my experience with iOS in, in those times was very incredibly positive. Um, I, I really did enjoy it, but I didn't, there was never enough there for me to go to come out of the experience and go, okay, well, I have to make the switch now. Like this is just so much better much than what I, what I, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's also probably a little bit at play there with the fact that like, you know, for, for the majority of my time at twit, I, I was producing and hosting a show called all about Android that literally was about Android, <laughs> uh, top to bottom and be disingenuous. It's just, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would be weird if I, like I was, I, I feel anyways, if I had, you know, hosted that show for years upon years and then suddenly switched, I guess it would be a topic for the show. But then <laughs> I, I always felt like it would make me a little less proficient or a little less of a kind of, uh, you know, speaking from a, a position of experience and authority around Android. And so I never really gave it much thought. It's not even that like I was tempted and I would do it if I wasn't doing this show. It just, I never really considered it. It, yeah. it was just never something I, it I truly a big considered driver 100%. For it. Yeah. So what, what Android flavor do you like? Are you a, a Google Pixel guy, a Samsung guy, use a fo- foldable? What do you like? <laughs> I do like foldables, but I've never owned my own foldable. Um, I have, Ever since Google started doing the Pixel, that's been that's m- been my top choice. Partially, well, for a couple of reasons. Partially because I always felt, you know, it was the same before the Pixel when Google had their Nexus kind of line of phones. And the story around the Nexus phone was... You know, this is a phone that's built in Google's eyes. This is meant to be a representation of what Google thinks, you know, a phone running Android could and in some ways should be. And it's kind of like a baseline sort of thing. Um, And so I always thought it was, you know, again, considering what I do, it probably makes sense to stay as close to the source as possible. So I always got the Nexus phones. And then the Pixel phones started happening and I just kind of stuck with it. I mean, ever since Pixel 1, I've just really loved Google's hardware design. Um, I really love their, their software choices for the most part. Um, you know, compare because there are a lot of Android phones out there and especially years ago, now things have kind of settled down a little bit as far as like going overboard with, you know, these software features that, that are pointless or, or naggy or whatever. <laughs> but I never really felt like Google did that to the degree that others were doing it. I always thought they had a really nice kind of balance between extra feature set and still just kind of like keeping it closer to uh, the, ori- or closer to a different business you know, vanilla, model, right? 
they got a different business model uh, to For show sure. you the best possible experience as opposed to to try to sell you other stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, of course. I mean, Google has its own, you know, interests in having uh, a hardware um, offering, uh, you know, in 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 its stable. Um, the, it gives them an opportunity to try things, you know, out before they roll them out to all the other Android phones out there. It gives them the ability to test out, you know, the integration of AI tools, you know, as as we've been talking about so much in the last couple of years. Um, it gives them a way to do that. And uh, and I'm always curious to see what Google's coming up with. I mean, they they have a, a real track record of uh, being pretty disappointing when uh, when they, you know, create something and then give up on it and, or, or <laughs> really? the, the wind changes directions and they decide uh, they're not going to do it anymore. But yet at the same time, I'm always still very curious and uh, interested in, in checking it out because they've got some serious resources there. So a lot of times they've they've made some pretty cool stuff. Do you, is the, one of the driving factors, the importance of being able to get this, the OS updates quickly? Absolutely. It is for me. Um, that's certainly very important to me. And, you know, the, the fact that those promises are extending further and further, I mean, it's just, I think it's great news. Isn't it now that, that Google is now offering, I think, what is it? Seven years of it updates. Many years <laughs> yeah, as opposed pixels. to hardly any years. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, Yes, so Pixel 8 and 8 Pro updates for at least seven years. I mean, this was unheard of a couple of years ago, you know? Right, and right. actually, I'd say in the last four years, just Android in and of itself, and I think largely directed by the um, by the example set from companies like Google and Samsung, they, they're the really, you know, they're the big players in the room that can kind of drive some of these changes for the rest so that they feel like they have to kind of keep up with it. But it was so for so long, a very big complaint of mine that like, you know, you're making these wonderful phones, but yet you're setting them up to fail so quickly. And uh, it, that is certainly one of those points that I would look a across, you know, the across the uh, the other side of the pond, let's say, and <laughs> um, and look at how iOS has done with their updates. And I mean, those phones can last forever. Um and you know, you know, it shows a real commitment on the on the on the part of Apple to do that. And I realize, you know, their their business models are different, but I wanted for some day for them to get to this point. And I'm happy to say that there. you know, Google has made it. You know, I, I think seven so, years is pretty darn ample. I've been uh, I've dabbled twice in buying an Android phone, and both times I got burned. Uh, where while they were still selling the phone, it was no longer getting updates. And the second Ugh, one I did that's was, horrible. I thought I was buying from Google because it was like, okay, I'm going to just buy a phone from Google and that way this won't happen to me this time. I won't, you know, I'm Lucy and, and Charlie Brown with the football. This time she's not yeah. going to pull it out from under me. And I bought a phone from Google, but it turned out what I bought was a Motorola phone from Google. It was the G7. Mm. And then Google said, yeah, we're, we're just, we're divesting ourselves from this uh, um, Motorola stuff. And they stopped supporting it. And so like, mm -hmm. it was, it was like a year and three months old and it wasn't supported anymore. And so I've, um, it, someday I may try an Android phone again, uh, but it would have to be a Google pixel, I guess, in order to be, you know, give me any confidence now. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an unfortunate, um, unfortunate experience. No question about it. Yeah. There was, there was a time there where Google and Motorola were, were best buds. <laughs> and, and actually there was a time, you know, a, a number of years prior to the G7, uh, that you got, um, where Motorola was making some of the more, in my opinion, exciting phones. And that was largely because of their tight kind of relationship with Google. And so, there was that trust at a certain point, I, I guess, if I had to like delineate, you know, this is like Moto X era and, and the Moto maker and all that kind of stuff. Like at that point, Moto was doing with their phones, what Google would later kind of do with its own pixel phones, as far as creating a really solid, um, design, uh, a, a, you know, software updates that you can depend on, um, some actual useful extra features and stuff, but you're right at a certain point, that trust was completely broken because you know, Google and, and Motorola kind of stopped that that relationship, and uh, you know it probably wasn't communicated very well to to people that that had happened. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't want to stay uh, be down this bashing lane too long. Uh, I just want to let you know I was hurt. But uh, yeah, let's, let's I, I really get it. 
let's start really start talking about how you use an Android phone with a Mac. And I've got a couple of categories here. The first thing I thought of was photos. I yeah. have, uh, I'm a big fan of iCloud photo library. I take a picture on my phone. It shows up on my Mac. It shows up on my yeah. iPad. Everything's all integrated. Um, I'm going to assume you use Google photos. Yeah, you would assume you, you're assuming correct. Yeah. Google photos. I've been there since they introduced it. I don't know how many years ago and, yeah, I've got probably 180 gigs worth of photos synced to it. I've actually had to key, which I, I don't know, you know, depending on who you talk to, that's either a lot or a little. <laughs> some people go crazy with their with their photo library. Um, I don't do full res syncing to my Google Photos uh, oh. library because I also back up locally to my Synology NAS, and that's where all my full res stuff goes. Um, so that allows me more more cloud storage um, without having to spend all the extra money on that because it really eats up space so fast. And that has, yeah. so if you're if you're on your Mac and you're on your on an airplane, you have no photos at all. Um, it, well, I mean, if I'm, if I'm connected to the airplane Wi-Fi, I suppose <laughs> I have it connected to Google photos. I have whatever photos happen to be parked on my camera roll on my device that I haven't deleted yet. But yeah, if I'm not getting access to the cloud, your oh, Mac oh and I'm, and I'm on my Mac. I see what you're asking. Right. Um, no, no, I don't, I don't really manage a local photo library on my Mac. Interesting. No. Well, so having it on your I don't feel the need to. I mean, I'm, I'm so like embedded into the cloud that like... I don't know. I guess I just kind of wait until I have internet access and I do the thing I need to do. I don't really think about it. <laughs> have you by chance ever played around with tail scale on Synology? Tail scale? No, okay. You I and have I have not. to talk about this afterwards. I've already talked to the audience about this, but I have a really cool tip for you for uh, uh, playing with your Synology and your Mac and your, and your uh, Android phone. It's a very cool thing. Cool. It's basically a virtual private network you can have with all any devices you want. And you can get to them, as long as you're on the internet, you can get to them from wherever you are without opening ports or anything like that. It's very, oh, very that's cool. great. Sounds okay, nice. so the Google Photos there. So if you make an adjustment, if you're on your Android phone and you, yep. say, change the lighting or crop a photo, does that automatically get reflected in the Google Photos that's online in the non-full resolution Google Photos? Yes, it will automatically upload. Like usually I'm given the option of like, do you want to overwrite or do you want to save as a copy? And I almost always save as a copy. I don't want to delete the original. And so, yes, that appears on my camera roll on my phone that automatically when I have internet access, which is almost always um, uploads to the, the cloud, uh, to Google Photos. And then when I'm home and I connect to my home uh, internet, then that uploads over to my Synology NAS. So it okay. kind of takes care of it without me having to do anything. Wait, how does thankfully. it get to your Synology uh, NAS? From, does it go from your phone? Yeah, it would go from my phone, exactly. I, okay. If it's basically my my the app that I have, the Synology Photos or Moments, uh -huh. I can't remember what they call it yeah, now. Yeah, they changed the name. Yeah, they changed the name and kind of changed the, you know, it, the app entirely and moved over and I finally got that all sorted out. That was a whole pain in the butt. But um, anyways, it's constantly kind of looking at my phone in certain folders to say, oh, there's a new photo here. Okay, cue that up for the next time that we're connected to the home internet and then we'll move it over. Okay. So are those full res photos backed up somewhere <laughs> back in the cloud? Or um, offsite? No, I probably should. I probably should have like a backblaze or something like that going so that I can um or you know, whatever cloud backup Some service. B2, um, S3 something. <laughs> something. Yeah, it's, it's okay. I probably it's, should. It's but. just your children. Your family, you know, well, you know, I, I totally, I, I completely agree with you. And then at the same time, I'm kind of like, you know, but if at the end of the day I did, like I lost the absolute high res of all these things, <laughs> I might be in a minority here, but while I would not prefer for that to happen, I wouldn't see it as the end, the end of, of all we things. We look at everything on a screen anyway. We don't print anything hardly anymore. I mean, I, yeah, so take a look at my, you know, almost 200 gigs worth of photos and tell tell me, I'm, I'm asking you as if you are me, but Jason, tell me, when are you ever going to go through that thing and pull out that photo from 2013 and blow it up so that it can be, you know, take up the majority of your living room wall? Like, I just don't have the desire to do that. I don't have the need to do that. I, as long as it's big enough for me to look at and not recognize that I'm looking at pixels, you know, then... I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's short-sighted thinking. No, no, Maybe I'm just... not thinking about future generations, but you know, and, and at the same time, like I do have it all, you know, going to the NAS and to the cloud. 
and I'm feeling pretty comfortable that things are going to be okay for a while. And I'm sure at some point I'm going to have to, you know, back that thing up and I will. Um, so I'm not too worried. I guess okay. is the All right. <laughs> so on your Mac, iCloud, or I'm sorry, the photos app basically has never been launched. It has no, it has no purpose in your world, right? I've launched it for certain projects, okay. Okay. Um, but yeah, but it's, but it's just not where I manage part of the work any of my photo library. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. It it also, you know, like I've got a, you know, MacBook Pro with a certain amount of storage space and I kind of don't want to like sacrifice 200 gigs of my storage just for photos to be there all the time when, when I can get it in other ways pretty quickly. You know what I mean? Like, like I I produce music on this machine and that's Mm -hmm. where I want that storage to go to that. And, you know, the other kind of mandatory things that I that I can't do in the cloud. I can't really produce cloud music. I mean, I know that there are ways, but I definitely do not prefer to do that. Um, so I would rather reserve the storage for that. You're, you're talking to somebody who has uh, over a terabyte of photos and I keep the high res originals on my local drive on my MacBook Pro. <laughs> Oh boy, and it's just it, like it's just parked there, just hanging out, taking yeah, up all how, that space. You're not giving enough money to Apple if you don't do that. I had to buy a four terabyte drive. So yeah, <laughs> apparently that's what I. I, need I had to start two doing. kids. I was able to sell one. I still got a spare. I got a backup. Okay, so good. I'm okay. Good. All right, you're covered then. <laughs> Let, let's switch gears and talk to the uh, the biggest elephant in the room. You're like a blue bubble person and a green bubble person on messaging. If you're on a on a on a Mac and on Android, how do you, what do you use? for messaging how does that work well, you're you're saying this as if i use messages on my mac which i really i don't, don't. Do okay i mean it's it's something that comes up every once in a while it's not something that i rely upon my daughter my older daughter has an iphone uh, my younger daughter has an iPad, so they actually, you know, they are in the iOS ecosystem. And um, at least with my older daughter, you know, she has an iPhone, so I could message with her. And you, you know, I'm sure you heard the the uh, the news, whatever, a handful of weeks ago before all the RCS Apple stuff happened with the uh, like Beeper, you know, apps like Beeper that have like a cr- a cloud kind of array of Macs that kind of are conduit for uh, bringing iMessages onto Android and kind of giving you all those features and you know, in the list of bad ideas, and everything. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's probably not the the wisest thing to do to just log your your account in on somebody else's server. But well, th- um, no, but think about it for a moment. You're uh, you're putting your uh, your iCloud e- uh, email and password address in somebody else's hands, and yeah. that is the address that a lot of people use as the recovery email for logging into their banks and places like that. So you're yeah, giving, it's, it's not that's smart. the crown jewels. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not smart whatsoever, but, um, but you know, I've, I've tried it and, uh, just to kind of see like, okay, well, what is this like? So, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And, uh, I just, I don't use it. Like it's yeah. not, it's not integrated into my everyday. And so therefore like I, you know, I've been on Android forever so it's so it would literally be teaching myself how to use my phone differently now. in a harder way. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so in, in a more convoluted way. What do you use? You're you're writing to Micah. I mean, wait, texting Micah. I mean, what would you use? <clears throat> it doesn't have to be Micah. I'm just throwing. Well, out yeah, there. like you know, it it depends on the context. If I'm doing something for work, you know, I'm I'm texting people from work in Slack. Probably Slack okay. is you know how we do Slack all of DM. our business communication. Yeah. Black uh, Slack DMS or, you know, or in the channels or whatever. Uh, if I want to reach someone, um, you know, directly, you know, I'm, I'm here I am in, in the U S of a, I'm using SMS like a, yeah, like, a caveman. <laughs> like no one else in the world is using SMS, but for some reason we here do. And so that's, you know, that's a largely how I communicate with, uh, with a lot of people in my life is, is through SMS. It's just the easy approach. And now with RCS, that, that experience is a little bit more enjoyable and I definitely see differences there. But, now, we haven't um, actually talked about RCS much on my show. Do you have a elevator pitch for what RCS is? Well, RCS is essentially a, the evolution or kind of a, a protocol that is meant to be the evolution of SMS um, and, you know, MMS. So, you know, SMS and MMS, they're very, very old protocols. RCS is still pretty old, actually. The the baseline standard of this, I think, was developed in 2008. 
but it allows for a lot of the things that Apple folks are really used to with iMessage. Things like, you know, um, some form of encryption, although not end to end encryption, unless you've got a modified version of RCS like Google does, but um, some form of encryption, you've got your, your read receipts, your typing indicators, high, high resolution digital and video sharing. Instead Things of little that, tiny, I, I thought oh, my, I thought my yeah. housekeeper had a flip phone because she sent me a video and it was like, I mean, I don't yeah. think it was a half an inch tall on my phone. And I said, what, what are you doing here? And I, I literally had no idea because I talked to so few Android people. I didn't know mm -hmm. that's what happens when you SMS a, a, a video from Android to, to iOS. Yeah, it's it's a nightmare. I mean, honestly, like, you know, and I, and I think sometimes this whole RCS, Apple, Google thing comes down in, into, you know, like a... Um, you know the the war of of the platforms like oh well android just needs to you know get their stuff together or apple blah 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 really at the end of the day it's a broken experience for both sides <clears throat> just it, you know no matter what that's just the plain fact if you're on ios and you're sending a text message to someone who's not on ios then it's sending through that standard um that standard approach that is Apple's choice to either, you know, support something like RCS to improve that, which thankfully they've they've finally chosen to do. Maybe um, late next year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and you know they're probably going to do it in a little bit of a, you know they're not going to give you the full full shebang. You know, it's not going to be everything that iMessage enjoys coming right. through via RSS or RCS. But I do think that it's going to help things. I think my point though is that this isn't just Google sour grapes. Although it is, it is partially sour grapes on Google's part because Google has tried many, many times to do something around messaging and done it absolutely poorly almost every time. Um, but it is also kind of like, you know what, Apple? Like, I realize that there are a ton of Apple users out there and they really enjoy communicating with each other. But if, if you're going to make the experience bad for the Android users that do happen to communicate with you in your life, then that's uncomfortable. And then you might not even realize, like, like you were saying, Allison, you might not even realize have realized or other iOS users might not have realized that, that when they're sending a photo, like I just had this happen this last weekend, when an iOS user sends me a photo, shares it in the way that you do between yourselves, um, and it comes to me, it's, you know, it's a down res photo. It's, it's hardly even, you know, it's, it's not even resed up to the limited resolution that I upload to Google photos, you know, like I can hardly blow it up. Sometimes it's really? like a, a postage size image and I that. I've, I've seen so many of them at this point that like, it's like, okay, that's, that's an iOS user. And like, it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's just <laughs> the, the technologies have refused to work together. And so that's why I'm happy to see the RCS thing. I don't do, I think it's going to solve all the issues. No, but I think it's at least a signal that they're willing to kind of make the experience better for everyone. And I think it's important because Apple isn't the only you know, phone floating around out there. There's actually a lot of Android devices. So they should communicate well to, to each other. And so the, the it shouldn't have to be that, a differentiator for the platform entirely. The other piece of that yeah. that I, I hear, uh, especially like in college, is kids will come home and say, mom, dad, I, got, I, got, I have to have an iPhone because no, I oh, can't yeah. get invited to any parties. And, totally. and the, the problem where, where message threads get splintered, that's been going on for so many years. And it's so cool quickly that it happens. Um, my friend Ron Simmons swore off the iPhone because they refused to give him a new phone when he broke it in his own self and it was totally his fault. But anyway, he he, <laughs> he swore off iPhone and he went over to Android, but his whole family's on, on the iPhone and I wanted to send something to his son. And so I sent it to the three of us and it was instantly broken. I mean, mm -hmm. it didn't ever once go to both of them at the same time. As soon as mm -hmm. I sent it, it was already two separate message threads. And that would 100% make me switch to an iPhone. Because I, See, not being what, part of that. That's what bugs me, though, because that would make you want to switch to an iPhone. And why have we been kind of faced with, for many years now, this situation? Like, that's exactly what Apple really wants, right? Like, right. Let's, let's totally keep this locked this. off. Oh, it's there. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And like, I get it. They're a business. They want to make money. They, they make a very tight ecosystem. And let me tell you, like in the times that I did do the swap with Megan. Like I, I saw the ecosystem in action and it's really wonderful. It's really great. Um, but, um, but that, that stuff just 
irks me. You know, it was the, it was the comment of like, well, you know, get your grandma to get an iPhone then or something like yeah, that. Tim from, and it's that. just like, this is not how the world works, dude. Like, <laughs> well, it doesn't it have is. to be this painful. It doesn't have to be. You can yeah. still be the behemoths and the amazing, you know, company that satisfies your, your users. You can still be all that and not make the experience painful Horrible for yourself for and else. for others in the process. What, what I really like about you, Jason, is you have not once used the word, the words that I, I it makes me crazy when people u- w- uses this word. You haven't said they should. You've said it irks oh. you, but saying they should implies that yeah. we know what all their motivations are. And and if you're a stockholder, right. no, they shouldn't. But yeah, so, I don't like so the word should, should doesn't matter. It, it's it's I'm an not irrelevant a fan of that word. word. Yeah, I've, I've actually it's it's funny that you point that out, because I, I, I think for the past like three or so years, I've uh, it's been my mission to not use that word. I hate oh, it. interesting. Yeah, because I've never yeah. heard anybody have this conversation without using the word should. So that was impressive. I've been trying not to. Um, yeah, I've been trying to use I want mean, to wish. But uh, yeah. yeah, should should, should doesn't matter. Well, so should I, should implies that you know better than anyone else. It's also a very shameful word. It's like oh well, and you didn't, and you should have known better. I just ugh, I took a I class like once it. from a professor at UCLA who talked about shooting on yourself and others. So doing it to yourself <laughs> is bad too. Like oh, I for should sure. have left e- earlier, and I wouldn't be late to this meeting. Well, that's not doing you any good. Yeah, talk about no, what I'm you're a horrible do. person. I should have done that. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. it's not good. Yeah, yeah. But philosophy Hmm. segment over. I still don't understand how you communicate. So day to day. Oh, okay. Pure pure SMS, you don't use uh, Signal or Telegram or WhatsApp or anything like that? Or do you do them all? Well, yeah, I mean, I do them all. I mean, I'm going to go ahead and open my my kind of messaging folder. I've got, you know, I've got my, my SMS, my Slack, Google Chat, which I never use. Uh, Facebook Messenger, hardly use uh discord i kind of factor in there because it is communication based but you know that's for a completely different thing whatsapp like i chat with ron richards from (laughs) you know we did all that android for so many years that's that's like my chat approach with ron it's all over the board and then of course there's beeper in there which i just need to deactivate and and close because i don't ever use it um yeah i but i would say the majority of like my one-to-one direct communication if it's not work related is probably going to be um just sms SMS. i'm I'm one of those i'm one of (laughs) those i actually talked to all of my friends my closest friends and family into getting on telegram because it's just yeah. so fun. Telegram's such a great platform. I really, really love using it. And so I convinced yeah. them to give it a try. And now they all know that if they want to talk to me, I'm over there. The way I look at it is when I want to communicate with somebody, I figure out uh, what do they use? Because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what I want them to use. I need to talk to them where they are if I need mm-hmm. something from them. So I just convert to whatever they want. And I, th- and I think that's why possibly, in, at least here in the U.S., so many people opt for SMS because we, we haven't kind of reached the point that they have overseas. Well, we, there's also not as much incentive to do so. My understanding of the overseas kind of cellular market uh, and cellular industry is that you actually have to pay uh, extra for SMS and for MMS uh, sending, at least in okay, some so parts. Okay, so data is cheap. But- and so- Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly that. Um, It costs more to send those dumb messages than it does to just hop on a Wi-Fi channel and and communicate through an app like WhatsApp. And here we don't really have that. Like it's just all baked in and we've been doing that for years. And so it's really hard to undo those habits. And I'm certainly a victim of that. So the bottom line of the messaging (laughs) question, though, is that most of the time you're communicating one on one with someone, you can't use your Mac to do it. You have to type on your phone. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but it's also not something that I've really had much experience with. I've done it a little bit with with my Chromebook um, when I've used Chromebook over the years. You know, there, there's some kind of and actually, no, you know what? I'm, I'm totally overlooking. I do have messages on my Mac. It's just in a browser. It's the Android messages app has a uh, a sync up so you know it oh. throws a qr code up on the screen i don't know why i didn't think about that initially um and i zap it with my phone and so then i have my threads on my computer so that's and i have that browser you know and that's window sms at home yeah yeah so basically it's just it's passing the information you know to and from the phone into that browser instance of android messages all the messaging okay. is happening on the phone still it's just okay. i have access to send and receive through the uh, web interface. One of the reasons I didn't like WhatsApp was I had to do that. 
was I had to have WhatsApp on my phone. I had to scan it, and then it would hand yeah. off control over to the browser-based WhatsApp or to whatever it was on WhatsApp on my Mac. Mm -hmm. And then I had to take it back. The next time I sat down, I had to do it again and again and again. I was like, ah, that's too much trouble. Yeah, it really depends on how much logging out and logging in you're doing on your machines. Like my machine that's at home, you know, it, it's it's just staying here usually. So I just kind of leave it logged in. And so it's always, right. so it's connected the minute I sit down. You know what I mean? If right. I go to work, it will, I will have already linked up that messages um, app on my phone to the browser version of it at work, but it's not actively syncing there. So it just says, do you want to use it here? And I say, yes. And it, bloop, it brings oh, it over. Okay. And it, so it's pretty easy. Um, every once in a while, I have to kind of do the re QR code scan, but okay, it's not but a big deal. The other stuff you could do Slack DMs from, from your Mac. You could do totally. uh, any of the other things. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I just hate typing on a little phone, but maybe it's because I'm an old. So do I. You're, you're this young kid. Young whippersnapper. <laughs> talking about I don't know that I'm very school, whippersnapper. Or, there was once upon a time, but um, no, I totally agree. Though I hate typing out long things on my phone, and I will avoid it like the plague if I if I have if I had the ability to. Well, that's one of the things that uh, I, I, it's later on in my notes, but I'm going to steal it and bring it up to here. Is one of the things I really like about having the Mac and the iPhone is if I have to put something in on the phone, I can type it on my Mac, copy it. And then just hit paste over on my phone because the two are because mm, of that's continuity nice. or handoff yeah. or whatever they're calling it mm -hmm. today. And I really enjoy that. Um, yeah, there are some oh, apps so that you can install or, or, you know, Chrome extensions or whatever that you can do some of that stuff with. But having it mm. having it baked into the OS. Uh, oh, that's, that's interesting. Really you can nice. do it through Chrome. Chrome extensions. That's you can. I don't. I don't really do that very often. Um, oh. But I know that I have. I, I couldn't even tell you what is the app. You know, there was there was a time when there was. Oh man, what is it? It's it's like a. Uh, yeah, I can't. Like a. Um, yeah, I'm blanking. I can't yeah. even remember the name of it. I'm. I, I'm. I was thinking Push Bullet, and that's not quite oh, the same. Although push maybe bullet. it is. Yeah. I just haven't it used it in something. a very long time. You know, if it was integrated and it was like always there at the push of a button inside inside of some menu and I could like trust that it would always be there, then maybe I'd use it more. But yeah. it, there is kind of a certain degree of like setup over here. Got to make sure the extension's installed and that it's updated and active and blah, blah, blah. You know, so There's it's just enough not, fiddly stuff. We don't need to add more. <laughs> it's not part of my habit. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And because for you, I imagine, you know, Features like that are so deeply integrated and just there. That's like the magic of what Apple does. Um, then, yeah, if, if I had that experience, I'd probably be more inclined to rely on it. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize it's there. So it may not be as important to other yeah. people as it is to me, but I use that one all the time. All right, here's mm -hmm. a couple of softballs. Well, how do you do email? Um, how do I do email on my Mac or how, how right. do you mean? Between the two, what are you, are you using oh, uh, the web browser? I'm Gmail? just using Gmail. I mean, primarily Gmail is like 99%. <laughs> I, I think it's all of my my email experience. So, you know, my phone is logged into Gmail. My my computer, that's that's what In I'm the using. Web browser? There's really, or do you use an app? Sorry, for yeah, that? from a browser. No, I don't use an app. Okay, because you could do Gmail in, um, in mail.app in the Apple Mail. Could, but... I, and it. I've and I've set that up and I've tried and yeah you know I I think what I'm realizing is there's there's kind of a fundamental thing for me and relying on the cloud I realize as we talk mm. about this yeah. um, and you know maybe part of that is that Google as a company is so cloud driven yeah. and especially if you've ever used like a Chromebook like that device exists because of the cloud like. They, it it really what I realized is in using the Chromebook, it really reinforced this idea that like, do I really need to have everything as an app on my computer if I can just open up a web browser, which is where I'm spending ninety percent of my time anyways, and just have a tab that has that app there instead? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the paradigm that I tend to uh, work within uh, more often than not. I, like I'm happier to do that than to launch yet another app that has its own kind of like siphoned off area. Um, and experience, you know, it also keeps me closer to Google's presentation of, of these things, as opposed to an app's interpretation of what Google's email right. should be. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. It is. And very I know that's different. different. I know some people mail. really love the app experience. Um, but I tend to not really rely on that, I guess. Interesting. Yeah. I'm definitely on yeah. the all apps all the time, hardly do anything yeah. through a web browser. Now that said, I use a fair number of apps that are actually, uh, what is it? Electron apps. So it's actually a web browser. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. 
but uh, yeah, I don't actively go do that. I'm assuming mean Google Calendar, Google Contacts. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. That's that's where I manage any and all those things. What about yeah. watching movies or something on your, like, let's say you take your laptop on a plane? Mm-hmm. Um, you... Well, I guess that depends on the service. Um, you know, I are, are you talking about like Netflix, like like offline Netflix, that sort of thing? Yeah, well... I guess maybe I'm weird there is I actually have movies on my, on my Mac that are resident there. Cause, cause we ripped them. So maybe that's a weird question. It's oh, the wrong okay. question. No, I don't think it's the wrong question. I mean, there are times when I do that and if I play them, I'm probably using like a VLC or something like that. You know, okay. the, the app VLC, just because ah, it's a good, it's I found good... an app you use. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> For very specific reasons, but yeah, actually, absolutely. This may be a completely wrong metric, but, um, Go to your applications folder and tell me how many apps are on your Mac. Because hmm. I want to say there's like 80 that are installed by default. I want to, I, I seem to remember that number. 133? I got 135. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, probably about 10 of those are the Adobe suite, if not 15. I have a lot of music production stuff on this computer. So, okay. you know, so there's a lot of apps tied into that okay. because like I said, like that's just not music production for me is not an avenue that I'm going to rely on the cloud, even though there are ways to do it. It's, it's not as um, robust as what I'm used to and have grown accustomed to over the years. So what, what that is largely the, the heaviest stuff on my computer is all uh, music related. Like what, what do you, what do you rely on? Well, I primarily use Ableton Live uh, as my digital audio workstation. That's usually where I'm composing these days. Um, prior Live. I've to, I've never heard of that. Uh, it's it's really fantastic. It's um so prior prior to Ableton, which is probably like only a year and a half ago, and um so probably from like 2004 till a year and a half ago, I used uh, Pro Tools, which I'm sure you've heard of. Yeah, um, yeah. Everybody's heard of Pro Tools at this point. You know, it's kind of the the industry staple. But I just got really bored with it and uh, started to get really uninspired That's from by Avid, it. right? Yeah, Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I decided to get the ninety day free trial of Ableton Live, and Ableton Live is is different. It's um, yeah, I mean, it does a lot of the same things as a digital audio workstation does, but it's really. Um, it's really excels in bringing a live performance to it. So it's not, not everything is pre recorded on a timeline. You can also kind of like fill a grid and have things be more of like a performance, which I don't really use it a whole lot for, but it's a really unique approach in how they lay it out for music production. I find it really inspiring. So, oh, that's interesting. Huh. So yeah, okay. so that's what I use for for kind of the main production, and then and then you know a lot of the other apps are just you know different plugins that have uh, standalone app op, you know options like Amplitude, which is like a guitar amp simulator, and uh, you know a bunch of others kind of along those lines. Oh, that's interesting. I, I my ears lit up on the uh, digital audio workstation because I'm still looking for a good, a really good digital audio workstation for podcasting. I know, they, right? Like, I yeah, use Hindenburg a, Pro. I've heard that Hindenburg is pretty good. I've not used it though. Pretty good is a perfect description. I I like it, but it's it's definitely written by Windows developers who were forced into also making it work on the Mac. So I'm always okay. writing to him saying, "Hey, so this is part of the the uh, interface guidelines. It's supposed to be able to do this, you know, like." Mm -hmm. uh, um, oh, the one that drove me crazy was it wouldn't stay in focus. Like if you select a field and then you like for a chapter mark, and then you go get the the text that you want to copy and paste in there, it is now lost focus, and you have to click it twice to get back in. And after yeah, that stuff, literally two years of bugging them, they just changed it so it follows the guidelines now. But it's like, oh, <laughs> come on, I should. And is that what you rely on? Is that is that your kind yeah. of primary right now? Yeah, of the yeah. digital audio workstations I've tried, it's the one I dislike the least. Um, yeah, right. I mean, it's fine, but it's just, it's not, it's not just right. You know, it's not yeah. quite there. Me meanwhile, so many people use Audacity um, because it's the the free choice and because so yeah. many other people use it and I can't stand it. So, you know, everybody <laughs> well, has still, their preferences. It's that Soviet era uh, inter user interface that I really appreciate about it, right? <laughs> it I, mean, really I, can, is. I can get it to work it and it does some things that are pretty yeah. nice. Uh, I've used totally. Amadeus Pro, which is also good, but I it's got 
parts of it that just make multi-track editing terrible. Yeah. Um, about once every six months, I write to Paul Kafasis of uh, Rogue Amoeba, begging him uh, to write a digital audio workstation. This year's email was entitled, What I Want for Christmas. And uh, every time he says, no, we aren't going to. I'm like, <laughs> But thank you it's, for continuing to write. It's right there. It's like you're you, you just I would stop using anybody else's. Whatever you write, here's my money. Take it now. Yeah, I will buy it yeah. from you. But anyway, yeah. That's nobody else's problem. What about note taking apps? What do you use? Note taking, I'm a little broken when it comes to note taking. I'm all over the map, which um That's yeah, the right answer. Kind of, I have a scattered use mind when it yeah, I mean, I you know sometimes sometimes I'll fire up a note, you know, some sort of like a sticky on on Mac for a, for a quick thing. Text edit, I I rely on text edit a lot for like when I'm doing live shows and I want like a scratch pad for me to throw things in. Ooh, Even though I, I could also a more fun one. Yeah, um, yeah. Cot editor, C O T editor. It's uh, it's technically I think it's supposed to be for coding, but the it's yeah, got text, one huge yeah. feature. It just opens up with a blank note. Oh, okay. And, and plain text. It, 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 I'm so tired of every app. Like I, I opened up numbers today. I opened up yeah. numbers. It says, oh, what would you like to do? I want a new file. Command end. Okay. Well, yeah. would you like to start with a template? No, I just want to, just give me yeah, a blank. Just, just, just open. Start. Just open to open. the thing. And that's what Cod Editor does for Cod me. Cod Editor. Okay. <laughs> so you're adding another one to my list. So yes. basically it's uh, it's text edit, it's stickies, it's, uh, <laughs> I've only recently started relying on notes, the, the, the Mac uh, mm. notes app. And I don't know why it took me so long, but I'm really enjoying that, you know, for syncing better. between machines and I think it's because it's like gotten that. better. It's, it's, um, I still don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of the way I like Hindenburg. I think it's fine. And I do keep yeah. some stuff in there. I did a, a thing recently on, uh, God, what was it on? Might've been on clockwise, but where I talked about the, all the different, uh, no, no, it was on, it was on DTNS. That's what it was where I said mm -hmm. the correct notes app is. And then I gave the, you know, 11 that I use. Okay. Use this one for this and this one's for this and this one's for this. And I have no idea where any of my content is. Yes, exactly. I'm always, yeah, jumping between like, wait a minute, where did I put that thing? And then, you know, I'm using uh keep in the cloud, you know, Google keep that's, oh, okay. that's like, you know, is where I good? might just hot. Well, yeah, you know, again, I th I think it's it's fine. It's it's good enough. It's it's the one that like if I'm out and one of my girls says, "Oh, man, I love that something something." And I, and my mind goes to, "Ooh, I should write that down for like a Christmas gift or something like that." It's the one that I fire up quickly and I've got that thing pinned on there and I just drop it in and move along with my day. You know, it's real quick in to put the thing down and move on and I can right. reference it somewhere in the future. And I know what I kind of keep there, you know, so it's, it's not all about, it's my quick scratch pad. It's not all about organizing and tagging and all that kind of stuff. No, I mean, things end up organized because certain things, you know, I, I'll create a new entry in order for, for these things to go in there, but I will archive a lot through it. So it's kind of like, okay, I've done those things, archive them, get them out of view, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. By the way, I find, um, uh, sticky, the sticky notes to be very useful for uh, clockwise. That's where I put my answers mm. to the questions. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stickies comes in handy. I mean, it's nice that it's, you know, bright yellow and just right there. And you know, that th because it's very easy for me to forget things. Um, I've only very recently been diagnosed ADHD. And so I've really been coming to terms with like what that means on how I actually get things done. And uh, I found stickies and just, you know, real life, um, sticky pads to be really useful for me <laughs> that bullet journal as well that's funny so you don't have anything that integrates between the mac and uh and uh your android phone well again like if if it does integrate it's because it's in the cloud google keep is you know automatically cloud in the same way that uh, you know gmail and calendar and contacts are maybe i should so try just... google keep because I'm not using that one yet. Fair's fair if you just cut it or I have to add one. Right? Yeah, you got to find a, a reason to use Google Keep. Any Anytime you have a note about Google, throw it in there. <laughs> yeah, because it's got to have a category where it can't find it. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't sound like you really miss any of the big integrations between iPhone and Mac, mostly because you're not experiencing it on a daily basis. Like we talked about copy and paste, continuity mm -hmm. camera. Are you jealous of that mm -hmm. one where your your phone can I be your camera? I think that's super cool. Like, I think it's a really, really neat feature. Um, you know, again, well, I realize you know, the webcam that I'm using, even though people aren't going to see it on this podcast, you know, it's not the best camera. It's a Logitech. I know, it looks really good. HD camera. It's fine. Yeah, well, that's um, what I'm using. 
Yeah. I, I mean, I'm sure that the phone, you know, might actually look maybe a little bit better than this with continuity, but I haven't found myself in a position where I'm like, yeah, if I just had that continuity feature, <laughs> all my problems would be solved. You know what I mean? Again, right. I, I think really when it boils down to it, it's just, I haven't had access to these things. And so I don't miss them yet because <laughs> I don't um, have them, you know? Do you use an iPad? I uh, I have an iPad that I use for a very specific purpose, um, but I don't you know I don't really tablet much. It's just if if I'm going to tablet, it's probably to either play you know Fallout Shelter, which yes I'm still playing Fallout Shelter, um, or I have a very old uh, iPad that I use uh, in, for a very specific purpose within music production. It's this little device called a Spire Studio that is like a little. A digital eight track that syncs up with an iPad. It can also sync up to Android uh, on an app on Android as well. But I just have like a dedicated iPad for that, so it gives me a larger view for it. So okay, maybe so outside using of the norm big, on that one. If you're, what's your lean back experience on the couch then? Um, if I'm on the couch and I'm leaning back, I mean. The phone? It's probably my laptop, to be honest. Oh, is it? I mean, okay. well, well, if yeah, I mean, I would say. Primarily, it's my phone because it's always with me and it's small and, and everything. If I've got like an immediate like, oh, I've got to check this one thing, it'll be my phone. But if I want to like be computing or, <laughs> or, or you know, or researching something or whatever, yeah, I'm not doing that on a tablet. I'm doing that on a laptop. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. My husband, Steve, who, by the way, says, hey. Uh, hey, Steve. <laughs> he, uh, he hates the iPad. He hates, he hates working in iOS. You know, the phone has its place because it has to be, but if he has a choice, he's, he's working on his MacBook Pro on his lap. So, you know, he's yeah. goofing around on Facebook while we're watching TV or something like that. He, he'll definitely be on his laptop. I kind of go uh, both ways on that. Once I got <laughs> the MacBook Air, I'm much more likely to use a laptop on my lap in, uh, okay. in the lean back experience just because it's so thin and light. I can pick it up and set yep. it down more easily. Yeah, well, absolutely. I've asked a lot of questions about what you, I felt like you were missing. What are we missing by not doing it the other way around that we could be experiencing if we had Android with our Macs? Oh boy, I wish I had read this question prior to the well, show. I snuck it in at the end I'd, before I'd, you- I'd have something <laughs> prepared. What are you missing from the Android experience? Yeah. Or the the Android to Mac experience? Because well, there's yeah. not really a lot going on there between Android and Mac. Okay, okay. But I, I mean, guess if it was the Android experience, sure. That might be too yeah. open ended at this uh, late hour in our recording. You know, I think, yeah, I think I think that a lot of the the early and long time kind of benefits of Android, you know, the the customization aspects, you know, th those used to be really big complaints or or really big reasons why some you know why yeah. someone who is running Android would say, hey. You're on iOS. Well, you don't know what it's like to customize your phone and truly own it because Apple makes a lot of decisions for you. And on Android, you can make any decision you want. And I think that that there's some truth to that in this day and age. But I think Apple's really done a lot to kind of un to make that not quite as true anymore as an iOS user. And correct me if I'm wrong. You can do a lot more to customize your phone. I think there is still. There are still certain things, and I, and I wish I knew what, what it was exactly, but setting a default of some sort that isn't Apple's default uh, yeah, is yeah, still yeah. a challenge, right? And that's right. something that, like, as an Android user, um, God, I, you know, over the years, I've relied upon that at times um, to, to be the case. And I would, I would be... Yeah, that would be super annoying be if I restricted. kept running into that and had to work my way around that, that limitation, you know? Yeah, we definitely live with, uh, what do they call it? The tyranny of the default is is that yeah. uh, once it's the default, I mean, we're now allowed to choose something other than Google for search, but yep. I don't so know how starting. many people do that. I try it, I dabble in it, and then I go back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, in Google search, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> Google is successful because so many people use their search and rely upon it and wouldn't use anything else, but um yeah, there, there. Are pro I know there are other examples, and I'm, I'm kind of blanking on on what those might be right now. But that has long been a really big benefit to Android, which is, you know, how how do you want to use your phone? Great, we'll let you do it. You Except know, you. it's kind yeah. of it's kind of a playground, which uh, which for some people, 
that's the reason right there. You know, it's right. like, I feel like it's my phone and so, somebody else isn't making a decision for me on my phone. I'm making all the decisions. I'm, I'm yeah. happy to be, have someone tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Some people appreciate that. And I kind of, I kind of fall right in the middle there. There are some times where I'm like, you know what, sometimes it's just a little too complicated. Like I just kind of want to set it and forget it and move on with my life. And then there are other times where I'm like, well, no, of course I don't want that search engine or whatever, you know, whatever. Or I want Google way, or I want ways, not, not uh, Google maps or Apple maps or whatever. I want yeah. that to be my default. Yeah. I right, can see the right. benefits of both. Well, this yeah. has been really fun. I learned a lot and it's just always such a joy to talk to you, Jason. Uh, if people want to yes. follow you online, they should obviously go to twit.tv and subscribe to all the shows and become a member at Club Twit. But uh, yeah. what about following you elsewhere outside of there? Well, very recently I set up um, a URL, raygun.fun. And I just did, I, I, it just sounds so nice. It's, it's all rhymy and stuff. But basically, if you go to raygun.fun, it'll take you to a, a page that basically collects all of my different social media accounts and, you know, different shows that I'm doing. It's all on a single page and easy to look at. And oh. it's just way easier to uh, say Raygun.fun than it is to uh, tell you my random username on all these different platforms. Cause I'm not fast enough at grabbing Jason Howell, it seems. So <laughs> sometimes I get it. Sometimes I don't. That's actually a fantastic URL. It's only six digits and dot fun. I mean, who doesn't want to go to dot fun, right? I know. And it rhymes <laughs> like break on dot fun. It just, ru- it just rolls off the tongue. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, let's not make it so long next time. This was a real blast. I enjoyed it. Absolutely, Allison. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure. It's nice to see you again. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond Light. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you'd like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. You're only charged when I publish an episode of the NoSillaCast, which, let's face it, it's every single week, so I don't charge Patreon for Chit Chat Across the Pond Light or Programming by Stealth episodes. Another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the NoSillaCast ways learn from you and takes a little bit of the load off of me doing all the work. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeed.com, and I really encourage you to follow me on Mastodon at podfeed at chaos.social. Maybe you want to talk to the other Nocilla castaways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeet.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.